on today's episode of Angel's Garage, watch as I transform these old beaten fenders into these beautiful pieces of art. Man, now the rest of the car looks bad. After completing the restoration of the hood and trunk lid in my previous video, I was just down to repainting the doors, the fenders, and of course, the whole body. I decided that since they were already off the car, that the fenders would be the next logical pieces to restore. Now I knew restoring these pieces would be a challenge, or more specifically, I knew that restoring the driver's side fender would be a challenge, thanks to this massive dent on the front. The previous owner I had bought this car from had accidentally backed a trailer into it, and actually this event was what led him to sell the car. He intended to restore the car just like me, but after a few years passed and after the trailer incident, he realized it was doing the car more harm than good just sitting there on his property. So he decided it was time to let the car go, on the condition that whoever bought the car was to restore it and not part it out. But anyways, enough talk. Let's get to restoring these fenders. First up, I need to remove all the old paint. I've had a lot of good luck with citrus strips so far, so that's what I decided to go with. I go ahead and literally coat the fenders with citrus strip and then cover the fenders with plastic sheeting. The plastic will help lock in moisture, allowing the stripper to work longer and more effectively. After letting the fender set for 48 hours, I pressure washed all the citrus strip off and was left with a relatively clean surface. The citrus strip had no problem taking a majority of the paint off down the bare steel. With the paint removal well underway, I moved straight into bodywork. This fender had been pushed in quite a ways, so my first task was just to get it somewhat back into shape. To do this, I began beating the crap out of the dent with a rubber mallet. With each strike of the mallet, I could actually feel the fender popping back into shape. After some more work with the mallet and the hammer and dolly, the fender was already starting to look much better. The next day, my dad decided to help me and sandblast the fenders while I was working on some homework. At the end of the sandblasting, I could see what I was truly dealing with. The front of the fender was looking better, but still needed a ton of work. The rear of the fender, though, was what caught me off guard. There was a ton of bondo on the rear of the fender, and it got quite deep in some places. This damage wasn't obvious at first because the dent was covered by the subframe on the inside. When I looked between the subframe and the fender to see if I could see any damage, I could see Bondo squeezed out from two holes that were punched straight through the fender. Man, I'm so glad I got a car that was in good shape. <laughs> While the passenger side fender was in much better shape, it also had some hidden Bondo beneath the paint. To get rid of all of this Bondo, I employed the help of my angle grinder, which made quick work removing all this filler. At the end, I was left with several more dents that I would need to fix. Yay! I was also able to uncover one of the holes in the driver's side fender. I have no idea what happened to this fender in its past life, but whatever it was, it wasn't good. With all the paint and Bondo gone, all that's left to do now is bodywork. I first set my sights on the large dent on the front of the driver's side fender. This spot still needed a lot of help, so I began working this dent out to the best of my abilities with the hammer and dolly. After a lot of hammering and dollying, I want to begin test fitting this fender back onto the car to see how everything looks. Before that though, I want to work out this damage on the body that occurred behind the fender. Some vice grips and the hammer and dolly make this damage disappear in no time. And with this area now fixed, I can now place the fender back onto the car. Seeing the fender like this gives me a good idea of what needs to happen next, and it even allowed me to see some damage I had previously not seen with the fender just lying down. With this new information, I began finalizing the bodywork up front with a slapping spoon. The slapping spoon allows your strikes to the metal to be more spread out, helping smooth things out. After finishing the front up, I began working on the huge surprise dent in the back. There was a subframe behind this dent, so the hammer and dolly was not an option here. Instead, I turned to the stud welder to remove this dent. I began by welding several studs onto the fender, and then using a slide hammer, I began slowly pulling at each one of the studs. Once I was satisfied with my work, I did another test fit onto the car. The fender was, well, actually starting to look like a fender again. 
Body work is still a skill I'm learning, so the body work on here isn't perfect. But I will say this fender is in much better shape than what it was before. When I had the fender on the car, I noticed this twist on the bottom of the fender. How do you fix a twist, you may ask? Well, you fix the twist with a twist. And after a few minutes of twisting the twist back into shape, I had the bottom looking totally straight again. This is definitely one of those issues I would have never picked up on had I not temporarily placed a fender back onto the car. While the passenger fender was in much better shape, it did still have one deep dent on the bottom. I go ahead and pull this dent out with the stud gun. With the dent removal done on both fenders, I turn my attention now to the holes on the driver's side fender. Unlike the person who previously restored this fender, I will not be filling these holes up with Bondo. And by the way, NEVER fill up holes with Bondo. I will instead weld these holes shut. I go ahead and begin welding at the edge of the hole, slowly building the material out until the hole is no more. The front of the fender also needed a little welding where a seam busted, and using a pair of ice grips, I quickly tack this piece back into place. With all the welding done, I go ahead and grind all the welds into shape, and I'm finally left with a holeless fender. The fenders are just about ready for body filler and primer now. The last thing I must do now is remove all the old sealant from the back of the fender. This sealant was placed along the edges where the splash shields and the fender met, essentially making the wheel wells watertight back in the day. Now though, I'm afraid the sealant could be a weak spot because if it ever busted off, the metal beneath it would be unprotected. So I figure it would be best just to remove the sealant and prevent that problem from ever happening. The last step before a primer is applying body filler. I went ahead and solid cleaned the surface and then applied a large helping of body filler to the surface. Even though I did my best to pull these dents out, if I ever wanted this fender to look smooth again, I would need a lot of body filler. I go ahead and apply body filler to both of the fenders and then begin sanding it smooth. After repeating this process a few times, I was left with some pretty good looking fenders. And with that complete, there's only one thing left to do. Get some primer on these fenders. I first begin by applying Eastwood's internal frame spray inside the subframe of the fender. The subframe and the skin of the fender have almost no space between them, which would make putting traditional paint in there almost impossible. Thanks to the low viscosity of the internal frame spray, the coating can flow into all the crevices between the frame and the fender, protecting it for a long time to come. Once the internal frame spray is cured for 24 hours, I can begin applying epoxy. After solvent cleaning the back side of the fenders, I begin laying down Tamco Epoxy Primer. After two coats, I was finally left with a good looking, and more importantly, protected surface on the back. After a few hours of baking in the sun, I was able to turn the fenders over and begin spraying the fronts of them. After another solvent wipe, I begin laying down more primer. It was definitely a bit nerve-wracking to lay down the primer on the fronts of the fenders, primarily because this would give me my first look at how the bodywork came out. The passenger side fender came out looking really good, although this was not surprising considering this fender was already in pretty good shape. What I was more concerned about was the driver's side, and the driver's side actually came out looking really good. It wasn't perfect, but all the defects were now pretty minor, so all in all, I was very happy with the results. The next day, I began work on laying down a high build primer. Now while spraying paint outside is pretty convenient, this is the major drawback right here. Bugs getting in your paint. Before any more spraying can occur, I first have to remove these bugs. Which isn't too hard, a little bit of sandpaper makes this job pretty quick. With that done, I go ahead and tack wipe the surface and then begin laying down the Tamco high build primer. The high build primer will fill in any minor defects, and once it's sanded, will leave you with a totally smooth surface. After the high build primer dries, I go ahead and flip the fenders back over so I can apply an undercoating. Instead of going with a traditional rubberized undercoating, I decided to give Eastwood's 2K ceramic chassis paint a try. I figured this coating might be more durable and better looking than a rubberized undercoating. Although the better looking part really doesn't matter. It's not like people will be looking at the backs of these fenders at car shows. And if someone did, then they are a weirdo, and I would kindly ask them to leave. 
Anyways, I go ahead and load up my paint gun and then begin spraying. This paint is very thick, so I had to make my passes slow just to make sure enough material was being sprayed out of the gun onto the surface. After applying two coats, I was done. This paint laid out very nicely, and after scratching at it with a nail, it definitely felt strong. So I definitely can't wait to use more of this stuff on the car. And now the back side of the fender is totally complete, I can now focus on finishing up the front side. I began work on the front of the fenders by block sanding everything smooth. After a lot of sanding, I wiped the surface down and began applying a glazing putty to some minor dings that were still present. While I was applying the glazing putty, I noticed a major defect that was not good. On the front of the fender, the inside was bent inward slightly, and after comparing this with the other side, I could tell this was not supposed to be there. This defect wasn't extreme enough to be noticed earlier. Now that everything was in primer, it was totally obvious now. While I could have ignored this and hoped for the best, I was afraid that in the future, there would be clearance issues with the hood, seeing that this is pointed inward. At the very least, it would look bad if the hood closed, as it would have messed up the gapping between the fender and the hood. Ideally, this should have been fixed by pushing the section of the fender back out, but I was afraid this could mess up the bodywork on the outside of the fender which at this point was looking pretty good. So my only option at this point was just to beat the snot out of this section until it was straight. This broke my heart, because other than being bent slightly, this steel was still in really good shape. But, with no other choice, I began beating the crap out of this section until it was kinda straight. And since I'm so good with hammers, I missed two swings and ended up denting the perfectly good molding on top of the fender. Fantastic! With this section looking ugly as sin now, I sand everything down with a die grinder. Once sanded, I wipe the surface clean and then apply body filler to this section. After a few minutes, I'm able to begin sanding the body filler smooth. And after sanding everything smooth, it was actually looking much better. The section was now straight. I applied some more body filler and sand some more until the section was perfect. With that disaster averted, I turned my attention back to the glazing putty. I began sanding the putty smooth on both the driver fender and the passenger fender. Once complete, I go ahead and check my progress by applying more filler primer. This time from a spray can, though. One area that was giving me a lot of problems was the body molding at the rear of the fender. No matter how I tried, I could not get this section looking smooth. This was primarily due to the fact that I didn't have a sanding block for this area, and I was thinking how nice it would be to have a sanding block made just for this body molding. Then I remembered that I'm an engineering student. I could just make my own block. To do that, I traced out a good, undamaged section of body molding onto some cardboard. After adding a scale to both of these pieces, I scan these cardboard pieces onto the computer and then import them into a CAD program. In this case, Autodesk Fusion 360, which is free for hobbyists and students. After scaling the image in the program, I trace out the body line and then start building a sanding block out of it. I then repeat this process and make a sanding block out of the other side of the body molding. With that complete, I send the first file over to my 3D printer and begin printing out my sanding block. After six hours, I had successfully printed out my first sanding block. I then washed the block and gave it a final UV light cure, then I finally had my own custom sanding block ready to go. And after another 6 hours, I had a second sanding block ready to go, both of them matching the contours of the body molding perfectly. Using my new blocks, I began sanding the rear section of the fender down. Both of the blocks worked great and had no problem smoothing out the surface. As you can see by all the spots, there was definitely some unevenness in my bodywork. With the sanding done, I go ahead and reprime the surface. One piece I forgot to remove before sandblasting and priming the fenders were these clips for the trim. As you can see by comparing to the new piece, the old clips had lost their springs, so they would definitely need to be replaced. To remove these clips, I remove the nut from the other side of the clips and then gently tap the clips out with a hammer and punch. After adding a little more chassis paint to where the nuts were, it's time to begin prepping these fenders for paint. To start, I begin by covering up all the black undercoating with paper and tape to prevent overspray from getting on it. And with that, the time has come. 
It's time to lay down some paint onto these fenders. I first begin this process by quickly sanding everything again to ensure the first coat of sealer adheres well. I then go over this freshly abraded surface with a final solvent wipe. While doing this, the solvent soaked towel glides over the surface effortlessly, allowing you to feel everything on the surface. I felt a little bit of unevenness in my body work that I couldn't see previously, so I quickly knock this area down with some sandpaper before immortalizing this defect forever. After wiping this area again to ensure smoothness, I then go over the whole fender with a tack cloth. My first coat of paint will be a sealer coat. The sealer will ensure the paint goes over a uniformly colored surface and will also cover up any body filler ensuring that paint doesn't soak into it or have a negative reaction with it. Another benefit of sealer is that if there's any bodywork issues, this will give you a final opportunity to catch it before moving on to your paint. I apply the sealer on without any issues, and after a final check, I feel comfortable moving on to the base coat. I go ahead and pour some Chalfante Blue into the paint cup, pour in some reducer, and since I'm spraying over the sealer, I must add a base coat hardener. Add a few spoonfuls of hardener and then stir the mixture up. I add this paint into the gun and then I'm good to go. I also spray the base coat on with ease and after an inspection afterwards, I feel good moving on to the final stage, clear coat. Now clear coat is the most difficult part of any paint job. The reason being is that you must spray enough clear coat on the surface to make it look shiny and smooth. If you spray too much though, it will sag and run. There's a very fine line between having a smooth, shiny paint job and a sagging, running mess. And to top this off, I'm using Tamco's High Solids Aero Clear. And while this is considered their best clear coat, it's also extremely thick and considered one of the most difficult clear coats to shoot. With all this knowledge in mind, I pour the clear coat into my gun and then do my best to apply it correctly. At the end of spraying, I inspect my final product. While there was some orange peel, I thought things had turned out pretty good. That was until I opened the back door to the garage about 15 minutes later. The light shined in perfectly and revealed what I truly had done. So check out this area. Looks fine, right? This is what I saw at first. Now let me get the flashlight and boom, run city. Not only did I put runs on the driver's side, but I also slightly sagged the passenger side too. Now the nice thing about clear coat is that you can wet sand and polish it. So in theory, I could remove these runs and sags without having to respray everything. However, when it comes time to spray the car, I want to make sure I lay down the paint as close to perfect as I can. So I decided it would be much better practice for me to just respray both the panels with more clear. I began wet sanding the defects out of the fenders, and the next night I have the fenders all ready for more clear coat. This time though I checked the TDS sheet on my clear coat from Tamco, and was pleasantly surprised to find they had updated the TDS sheet. This update included a tips section which gave more detail on how to properly apply the clear coat. With these new application tips at hand, I felt more confident than ever applying this round of clear coat. This application went well with the driver's side fender, which came out looking pretty darn good. The passenger side fender, well, let's just say I royally screwed up this one and it came out worse than it did before. Now, my excuse is that the lighting on this side wasn't good. That's my defense and I am sticking to it. But in any case, I now needed to fix this fender again. I set the driver's side fender aside for now, and then begin wet sanding all the runs out of the passenger fender. Once complete, I face the fender towards the shop light to give myself adequate lighting, and then begin a third round of applying clear coat. This time, I gave the passenger fender a successful coat of clear, albeit with a little more orange peel than I normally like, but I could live with that. With the painting complete, I can now remove all the masking tape and paper from the backside of the fenders and move on to the final job, attaching the stainless steel trim. Now, I had full intentions of reusing the original stainless steel trim. They were dented up quite badly, so I knew it would be a lot of work to get these things straightened out and looking good again. However, at the discovery of a hole in the trim, I knew these pieces were beyond saving, at least with my skill set. I decided the best route moving forward was to replace these. 
After some searching online, I finally could get brand new reproduction pieces from the bird's nest. And not too outrageously expensive either. So, I ordered the trim pieces for both fenders along with two mounting kits. And four days later, I got a huge tube in the mail. Inside the tube, I found my trim pieces and mounting kits, all in perfect condition. And I must say, these trim pieces look amazing. To mount these, I first needed to install the retaining clips. Since the trim pieces had been removed by the previous owner, I wasn't certain on where the retaining clips and the anti-rattle clips go. So, after consulting with the shop manual and the diagram on the Bird's Nest website, I was able to determine that the retaining clips were mounted where the recesses in the trim rail were, and the anti-rattle clips were placed halfway between each retaining clip. To install the retaining clips, I gently tapped them down with a hammer until they were fully seated. The anti-rattle clips were installed by simply spreading them apart and then sliding them down into place. Next up are the spring clips. These clips are installed in the trim piece first. However, this installation can be a little difficult. To install these clips, I had to press down on the trim and the clip against the workbench. And after some effort, I was able to seat these clips into the trim. The diagram showed some sealant going between the stud and the fender, and I had the perfect sealant. To seal this, I will be using tacky tape. Tacky tape is a thick, rubberized tape that is typically used for sealing windows. However, its strength and flexibility make it ideal for other sealing applications. I cut off a small piece of tacky tape and then punch a hole in it with a scribe. I then press the tacky tape onto the retaining clip stud, making sure to press it down all the way to the base. And with that done, it's time to install the trim. I first place the stud into the hole, and then align the trim to the best of my abilities. Once in place, I begin pressing the trim down. The trim snaps in place once pressed down, making this installation super simple. With the trim in place, I install the retaining screw at the rear of the fender, and then install the retaining nut on the front of the fender. With the driver's side done, I then repeat this process on the passenger fender. The driver's side fender looked fantastic at the end of installation, and the passenger fender looked pretty good too. For some reason though, the passenger side trim wasn't wanting to seat down all the way. After a lot of pushing, I still could not get the trim to seat down all the way. It almost felt like the trim was interfering with the anti-rattle clip on front, so I decided it would be best to remove it. Using a tape-covered screwdriver, I gently pried the trim up, and once I had enough room, I pulled the anti-rattle clip out. Once out, I reinstalled the trim. The trim still wasn't quite seated down all the way, but it was much better. And with that done, the fenders were officially complete. I went ahead and temporarily installed them on the car to see how they looked, and they looked great. Are these fenders perfect? No, not by a long shot. But that's kind of the point. At the end of the day, my restoration doesn't have to be perfect for me to enjoy it. And considering what these fenders looked like before, I must say, I am quite proud of myself. Well, that's it for today's video. Thank you all so much for watching, and a huge thanks to everyone who subscribed to me. I'm nearing 350 subscribers out at the time of recording this video, and it's so exciting to see how many of my subscribers are restoring Thunderbirds of their own. A few of them even with their own YouTube channels, just like this one. So I just wanted to take this moment and say, to everyone who comments on my videos, and to everyone who subscribed to me, thank you. And to everyone, I'll see y'all next time. Bye!